thank you for the, uh, for the invitation, for the welcome, for organizing this uh, talk. So uh, the context of giving this talk today is that um, there is uh, in process a translation of, into French of the book The Will to Improve, which has taken some years to organize and is now nearly complete. Uh, the idea then is that this will be available for Francophone readers, uh, both in France but also in Francophone Africa and you know places where there's um, programs in development studies and anthropology and so on, which we hope uh, will find it of use. Um, since the book was published, it has, uh, to my um, satisfaction, I would say, um, been quite widely read and used in teaching and in research, really in every continent. So although it's uh, focus on Indonesia, I think maybe the conceptualization or the analytical framework has made it something which has been able to travel beyond the regional boundary and do lots of, I hope, uh, interest, definitely interesting and I hope also useful things. So what I wanted to do today is just very briefly, since many of you probably know the book, um, just to briefly recap the main arguments that I made and then to talk briefly about some of the sort of the impacts of the reception, particularly in Indonesia, since I did manage about five years ago to uh, have published an Indonesian version, which is, seems very important to me that you know, we should publish in the language of the place where we're working. Um, so that was done. And, and then I want to talk about my thinking about the book today, or at least about its arguments. <coughs> like where are we today with the will to improve? Like what are its kind of current forms and iterations and things we should be watching uh, since this story is definitely not one that's finished. So what I tried to do then in the book, The Will to Improve, is to make the whole process of intervention strange. This idea that one group of people, authorities, experts, trustees as I call them in the book, uh, planners, would for some reason take responsibility uh, for the welfare and the well-being of another group of people uh, and uh, intervene in their lives. So we now take this rather for granted under the label of development, but if we do step back and think about it, it is quite a strange thing, you know, that one group of people should take upon themselves to intervene in the lives of others. So in the world of um, development, you know, we're familiar with it. Of course, it has a much longer history. Uh, certainly it was present in colonial times when colonial authorities <coughs> typically had uh, at least a dual or in some cases a triple mandate, you know, profit for commercial enterprise, revenue for the colonial apparatus, and the well-being of native populations were often goals which were pursued simultaneously, uh, producing all kinds of tensions and contradictions, but that element of the will to improve or the idea of, you know, of native welfare has a very long history in colonial thinking and practice. And going back further, um, the theorist that I drew on for conceptualizing this was uh, Foucault's work on governmentality or the arts of government. Uh, and he was interested in tracing um, a process which began in the 18th century and intensified throughout the 19th century in which the whole art of government came to be uh, defined in terms of what I think of as the will to improve. Basically, um, the analysis of uh, social processes, economic processes and so on, which became visible through statistics, which one could then assess you know, and evaluate around a norm. Why is the eastern part of the country doing better than the western part? What's wrong? Why do these people in this area suffer from epidemics and famines when these people don't? And basically, you know, com looking comparatively through statistics and other mechanisms, beginning to identify, therefore, problems to be resolved right, in the interest of the well-being of populations. So um, that's you know, the longer historical trajectory of, of this. And of course, Foucault traces <coughs> this to Europe, but I think if you were speaking to China scholars, you know, they would dispute the European origin, right? They would say that Chinese governments uh, were doing this very much earlier. You know, the responsibility of um, emperors and so on uh, often included the well-being <laughs> of the population and sometimes quite elaborate intervention into preparations to anticipate, anticipate famines, floods and diseases and so on. You know, it's not necessarily something just of European origin. Anyway, so this is the, this is the field then, this will to improve. That's what I was investigating. And uh, this, in order to operationalize this will, you have to basically um, 
the procedure involves partly what Foucault called problematization. You know, you have to identify a problem that you wish to solve. Um, but you also have to form a technical matrix in which that problem can be identified. It has to be bounded. You can't intervene in everything. Um, and the, the vectors and forces in which you can intervene have to be you know, separated out so that you can come up with a plan in which problem A plus solution B leads to C a beneficial result. So that whole process of bounding and identifying a technical matrix is what I call rendering technical. Um, and I think that's a kind of a characteristic requirement of the operationalization of the will to improve. It can't just be a vague will. In order to happen, it has to be translated into programs, and this is how programs have to work. Of course, um, unlike some scholars who have argued, I'm thinking of um, Tim Mitchell, Rule of Experts, and some others, uh, that you know, expertise dominates. Um, what I argued in the book is that these, such a technical matrix can always be punctured by a critique that it cannot contain. So every, every problematization, every technical matrix, every attempt at drawing a boundary around what one will intervene in and what one will set aside can always be criticized. Someone can say wrong problem, wrong boundaries, important things which have to be considered are left out, it won't work, right? From all kinds of points of view, a technical matrix is likely to um, encounter a critical challenge. One of the kinds of challenge that particularly interested me in the book is the kinds of challenge which is launched by people at the receiving end of all this help and the receiving end of all of these programs of intervention who often come up with their own critical analysis of the problems that, they con that confront them as well as the deficiencies of the schemes which are launched in the name of their well-being. So many people can be critics, not just academics like us, you know, who can read the program documents and find holes in them, uh, but also people who are uh, recipients of all of this kind of help. So um, not surprisingly, um, you know, the results of improving interventions are not as planned. Anyone who works in development uh, knows this. This is completely banal. Um, but what I did argue in the book, in the kind of structure of the book, is that even an intervention which does not succeed in its own terms does things. It has effects um, in the world. And so uh, it's not enough to just say the project failed. The question is always, but what did it do? Like what were the processes in which um, a change was introduced which would not have been there if not for the intervention itself? And how do <coughs> different kinds of uh, projects, forces, and relations collide as things actually work out on the ground. So in the book I called this the witch's brew, again quoting Foucault, who said if he had been interested in imp um, studying the inside of the prison, right, he would not have just looked at like what is it to punish, you know, he would have looked, he said, inside the witch's brew of what actually goes on inside prison institutions, which is clearly a far more complex thing than like the schema of why do we imprison or how do we punish could possibly reveal, right? But Foucault said that wasn't actually his interest. He wasn't interested in the witch's brew, but we as anthropologists are interested in this. We're interested both in the program, you know, what is it that was, what was the, the rationale and the logic of intervention and what happened and so on. So the uh, structure of the book follows that logic. So chapter one, uh, what I do is I really examine the colonial era and give a kind of an overview of at different historical periods, uh, what was it that the Dutch colonial authorities thought was wrong with Indonesian society? Like what was their diagnosis? And what was their prescription? Like in what did they attempt to intervene? For what reasons? Um, and uh, you know, what were the results? But of course, in that chapter, because I'm doing it at the scale of more than a century and over an entire archipelago, uh, I can't get into too much depth about either the programs or the interventions. So to get deeper, I then selected one area, which is a highland area in the central center of Sulawesi, which I was attracted to because it had been the site of numerous improvement schemes going back to the colonial period and through to the present. S so many different groups were busy 
improving things in the highlands of Sulawesi, and that seemed to me strange. Like, <coughs> why are all these people here? What is it that they're trying to do? What is so wrong with these people that wave after wave of improving intervention has been you know, brought to this area? So um, then chapter, the, the organization of the main part of the book then is a kind of a layering. So one chapter which looks at the programs, like what was to be improved, a following chapter which looks at the effects, what then happened. And then the next chapter looks at the next round of programs which inherit you know, the complexity and often the mess you know, created by the interventions before and again try to bring about certain kinds of planned improvements and so on. So that's, that's basically the, the design. So in chapter two, I start with the Dutch missionaries um, who entered the Highlands around the turn of this, around 1910. And uh, their goal, of course, was to Christianize the population, but they were also had mandate for welfare. You know, you, there's no point in Christianizing people who are going to die from famines and epidemics. So the welfare of the population, even from a missionary perspective, was very important. Uh, so they were really were the first to become involved in uh, technical interventions. And their idea was that they should, uh, if they resettled people from the highlands into the valleys, they would basically cut off their relationship with their territories, with their old system of land tenure, with the feuds between family groups, the headhunting traditions and so on, with their ancestors, by, by physically removing them to a new place, they could basically reform them into a new kind of society. They could radically reconfigure their social, political, economic relations simply as, a, uh, as an outcome of having removed them physically to a new place. All these new institutions would have to arrive, arise. Um, that idea of resettlement is the kind of magic bullet for social transformation uh, was repeated and is still being repeated actually. Um, so uh, under Suharto's new order, there were similar projects to resettle people. At that stage, people were defined as too backward, uh, backward tribes, people who needed to be civilized and they were rounded up, um, persuaded to move or sometimes forced to move into the valleys, given what I think of as a kind of modernity package, like a piece of land and a house and some dishes and some clothing. And the idea was that if you, if you put them in the right place and give them the right stuff, they will therefore sort of adapt and change their economic and social and cultural practices to conform to their new realities. So something very similar to the missionary idea. What were the results of this? So chapter three is the first attempt to look at the results of all of that. And what I found was that although resettlement projects aim to uh, the concept is that you will fix people firmly in place. In fact, what resettlement projects do is they radically unsettle people. They move them from one place and put them in another, but that new place usually has prior claimants, other people who, whose land it was, who dispute the presence of the settlers. It also is often bad land, subject to floods and diseases, and that's <coughs> completely logical because if it was good land, someone would already be living there. <laughs> the natives tend to be actually rather good at identifying um, the fertile land and the good spots which are not you know, vulnerable to flooding and so on. So most resettlement projects run into both social and technical difficulties and don't actually deliver um, the uh, stable livelihoods and stable land base that is um, planned. So, uh, and of course there, there are other reasons for that, but in brief. So uh, the output or the outcome of this first round of resettlement then was basically to unsettle people from the land, also to create or at least um, enhance some pretty fierce ethnic and religious differences and you're mixing populations, putting Christians you know, with Muslims, putting people who are successfully developing uh, new farming, entrepreneurial farmers who are developing cocoa at this stage. Um, so basically, you know, economic, political, social, religious uh, <coughs> divides come to coincide, a sort of an us-them type of situation, which in this case led to um, very violent conflict. So you can't say that's not what the missionaries planned, it's not what the resettlement 
projects planned, but it is the effect of having moved people, unsettled them, destabilized them, introduced new populations. Of course, other things like building a road, you know, which increases the um, attraction of the area for migrants from elsewhere. So um, the next iteration then is conservation. So into this messy environment comes the concept that the main part of the highlands should actually be a national park. And uh, so the Nature Conservancy, the Asian Development Bank, other big agencies are involved in this. And this, of course, is also in the name of improvement. And here the, the good is a global good. It's sort of protection of biodiversity resources and so on. If it was today, it would be carbon and climate change. But at the time, it was biodiversity was the name of it. Um, and so what then is the problem that's diagnosed? Well, the problem is that there are people inside the park. There are people who've been planting coffee there for generations. They actually started planting it on Dutch command as a way to pay their taxes. Uh, they also have former village sites and so on. So again, the park is not actually empty land on which you can just imprint your will. You know, there's other people's uh, projects, claims and desires already present there. Um, so the concept, the, the sort of technical matrix to solve this problem uh, was to do farming improvement. The idea was that if you could increase the productivity of the farming around the park, then people would uh, give up their claims. They would not bother with their old coffee trees. They would stop harvesting rattan, which was one of the products. And so agricultural improvement was the goal. And the project documents, including those from the Asian Development Bank, came up with some fantastical numbers about you know, increasing productivity by 100%, or in some documents, more than that. So the, the, the idea that there was some technical fix which could magically increase productivity sufficiently to keep people out of the park was really the, the motor of this round of intervention. So two problems, not surprisingly. First of all, the technical fix did not exist. They had no means to increase productivity by hundreds of percent. And secondly, even if they had, uh, what's really the logic which would make successful and lucrative farmers stay out of the park? If anything, they're going to want to go in more because now they actually have a lucrative crop to plant and uh, the parkland becomes even more attractive, right? So it was a bit of a flaw in the logic as well as in the actual delivery. Um, so uh, another factor that comes in here is cocoa. So there's a cocoa boom going on all across Sulawesi at this time. So land around the park becomes extremely desirable. And at one stage, busloads of people from the south of Sulawesi uh, arrived in the highlands, literally in rented buses, looking for land to buy from the locals so that they could uh, plant cocoa. So that's, that's something which the park managers, uh, and the, in this case the Nature Conservancy, had not really factored into their plans, that this land would suddenly become attractive to new migrants, valuable for a new form of production. And so the pressure on the park increased enormously, and not surprisingly, um, park conservation failed. What did it do, though? It didn't just fail. It actually um, produced another effect, which was the politicization of the park border population. They became enraged at the idea that all of this good agricultural land just across from their windows, or as one of them put it, spitting distance from my kitchen door, um, was now uh, closed off by the park boundary and they were not allowed to plant there. So they saw everyone else around them prospering from cocoa. They're sitting right next to valuable land and they're told, you know, you can't do this because these are the lungs of the world. And they're saying, we too need to eat, you know, these these flora and fauna that you love so much, we promise to take care of them well, but we too you know, need land to eat. So you could say they had their own analysis of the problem that confronted them, and the problem that confronted them was the shortage of farmland, and what they saw was the unjust imposition of park boundaries without consultation and without properly accommodating their own land needs. So as they said, you know, by all means have a park. Those mountains over there, they're far too steep to park, to, to plant, that's the park. That's where the park should be. You know, we would never try to farm there. You're welcome to it. But this good land here, flat land by the road, this is for people. 
we have to be here. So what happened was uh, a park invasion, basically. Uh, groups mobilized to invade the park, and they made the argument um, in terms of, you know, their view of the, the deficiencies of this plan, you know, basically conservation versus livelihoods, which is a very common tension in what was called, you know, ICDP, right? Integration, conservation and development. These projects all founded on this tension between livelihoods and conservation. Um, but they added to it all kinds of very specific critiques. They said we had to move, you know, out of the hills because there was erosion, but there was no erosion. They said, um, you know, you have to move out of the park because of the monkeys, but we feed the monkeys. Do you know, do you not know how much they love our coffee berries? They get fat on our coffee. Like, let us continue to grow our coffee and the monkeys will be just fine. Like, they basically um, contested expert knowledge in terms of their own expertise about <coughs> the landscape, the flora and the fauna, you know, who prospered and their own role actually in making, um, uh, space for different kinds of uh, entities in, their, um, in that arena. So um, they became politicized from their own critique. They also joined up with NGOs who were at the time um, mobilizing in two directions. One was in terms of the concept of indigenous people's rights, the land rights of indigenous people, which had become a popular idiom in Indonesia by the mid to late 90s. And uh, those NGOs uh, hooked up with these people and said, actually, you know, you, you, you should be entitled to this land. It's your customary land, right? Um, also, in terms of a critique uh, that the NGOs were making of especially ADB projects, which they said were hugely expensive, put a huge uh, debt burden on the national treasury, mostly failed and, you know, deserved a, a critical scrutiny. There was a problem with the indigenous claim which goes back to the earlier part of my story, because some of the people who had made claims on the park were not actually from that place. They were people who had been previously resettled. And so now there's a big debate. Well, who is indigenous here? Are you indigenous because you're from the province? Are you indigenous because you're from this very particular spot? And what happens if you were moved here by force? You would be, you're only here because you were put there. And you were put on land which is in fact infertile and um, unfarmable, and now you're trying to help yourself to accomplish the goals which the program promised, which is land and, you know, a prosperous future. Are you wrong? Are you not, you know, correct and still in line with government programs? So these were the kinds of arguments that were made, um, but it became a very complex debate among the NGOs who weren't used to having the claims of the indigenous peoples movement and uh, land invasion movements kind of really uh, collide in quite a serious way. So it caused a big upset, uh, not only with the government, but also among NGOs who had different concepts of who should be where. In this part of Sulawesi, the indigenous group tended to be more allied with the park. Um, they said, you know, indigenous people can serve the park or, or are interested in conservation. These other people, these are land invaders and they're not from here, right? So it, it divided in quite a nasty way, really, um, different groups of people who at the end of the day were very similar. They were all farmers looking for a piece of land um, to grow cocoa, basically. So following this, so that's like my upset chapter, the, the what happened next chapter. The next round was another intervention by the Nature Conservancy um, this time more intense. So by now we're around 2002, 2003, and the Nature Conservancy has a new vocabulary um, which is about collaboration and participation. So they had this idea that the problem in the past was that they weren't sufficiently participatory in their approach. What they need to do now is they need to bring in the park board of villagers as partners. Um, the difficulty though is that they didn't want to be partners in conservation, right? They wanted to have access to the park for farming, um, but the, uh, the agency was bound by the park borders, which were set in national law and could not be changed. So the Nature Conservancy couldn't actually give the people what they wanted, which was access to farmland. So what could it do? What kind of net technical matrix could it come up with to solve this problem? And what they came up with was a highly managed participatory process, the objective of which was to intervene in the hearts and minds, one could say, of the villagers and make them 
desire conservation and to make it their own. So the idea was that if you spent enough time in workshops, um, you know, they would begin to recognize the value of the park and they too would want it. And once their desires had been transformed, then they would be partners in conservation. Um, so uh, what I do in that chapter is map out, like, how, did, how do you actually go about that? Like, how do you technically go about trying to change people's desires so that they will desire what you want them to desire and forget their previous desire, which was to access the park for agriculture, right, for, for cocoa? Uh, not surprisingly, it was not successful um, because the people disputed it, right? They said, you bring us here in these workshops. We, they said, we've spent the whole day drawing with paper and markers, like you're treating us like school children. And then we stick it on the wall. That's like, that's like children do in nursery school. Um, we have a serious problem here. We, we need farmland. Like, where is the answer to our problem? So uh, the documents um, reveal all of this. Right? They reveal the tension between the attempt to direct conduct, or in this case, to kind of transform mentalities, and people's own critical insights. And the documents actually show how critical insights get filtered out of the documentation. So they're often there in the initial meeting reports. You can see what people actually said, you know, uh, and the critiques that came forward. But when you read the final project documents, all of that's gone. And it's just, we held a participatory meeting and the people agreed to participate in the park or something completely bland. Um, all the meat has gone. So project documents was something that I used and read intensively for this project, but always doing what I call a kind of a cross-reading or a counter-reading in which you're reading one document in relation to another, often in a sequence, to see how all the tricky bits and all the difficult bits get slowly filtered out. Um, but also in relation to a situation which I knew. So what are the elements going on in this environment which are absolutely relevant to this problem, but which are not in the documents. So that process of boundering and bounding and selecting uh, was something which you know, I was tracking. OK, so then the, the um, oh, OK. Um, OK, the last project. So that was my sequence in Sulawesi, you know, where I tried to get some density to this question of kind of improvement, response, improvement, response, effect, that kind of thing. The last chapter um, took, went back to the national scale and it looked at a World Bank project uh, which was designed by social scientists, actually anthropologists working for the World Bank, um, just after or at, at the end of the Suharto era and into the post-Suharto era. And what was interesting was that this project was based on an enormous amount of ethnographic research. These were anthropologists and they had the idea that if you fully understood the problems in Indonesian villages, you would be able to come up with um, you know, good solutions which were kind of based in a proper knowledge. So whereas one in, in the past, one used to criticize World Bank projects for being clumsy and ignorant and top down, um, they were gonna do the opposite, right? They were gonna be based in this intense ethnographic research. But of course, um, because at the end of the day, the bank is about selling loans, um, this was research which had to lead to a project outcome. At the end of all of this research, you had to come up with a matrix in which this is the arena of intervention, you know, problem A, solution B produces a good result. So how did they do this? Well, what they decided was the problem in Indonesian villages and what they thought their diagnostic ethnography encountered was a real deficiency in participation and accountability. Somehow, the whole new order was clumsy, was top down. You know, people were invited to participate, but it meant nothing at all, and they never thought it would. Um, there was no accountability from government officials. Levels of public service were horrible. So they had this idea that they could, and it was a huge idea, and this became more than a billion dollar project. So we're not talking small stuff here. Um, their idea was that you, they could transform the whole of Indonesian society by starting from the bottom up, if you could make villagers uh, demanding so that they would demand of their government uh, a good standard of project delivery, proper accountability, you know, participation in decision making, if you could basically train them in new practices and make them 
expect and demand this from their own government, you would not only transform the villages, but they would then put pressure that would transform this whole unaccountable, clumsy, top-down system from the bottom up. So it was social engineering on a fantastic scale. Uh, and this was what they set out to do. So they, they started you know, with about 10,000 villages, and by the end, uh, a decade later, they covered the whole of Indonesia. Huge money involved. Basically, the model, which then became used by the World Bank everywhere, the CDD model, Community Driv Driven Development, is what it became. But the idea is you offer a pot of money, uh, call it a block grant, and then uh, people are educated through a process of uh, consultation and participation, which is uh, managed by a facilitator, out of which comes project proposals. These are supposed to be competitive. The best proposal will win. The criterion has to be technical feasibility, but also that it's pro-poor. So the idea is by making pro-poor a criterion, you will force every group in every village to start thinking about, you would basically change their mentality. They would have to think about who are the poor? What do they need? Like how can we come up with a project design which would meet their needs? If we can come up with the right kind of design, we'll win in the competition, right? So you're basically using incentives, um, carrot and stick, to uh, encourage a new way of thinking among villagers, uh, which would then filter all the way up to the top of the government. So it was, um, it was fantastic in several ways. I mean, fantastic in the sense of the, you know, the intelligence and energy which went into planning, you know, imagining such a thing and attempting to deliver it. It was also fantastic in the sense of fantasy, in the sense that um, it didn't actually work. And since then, um, a decade later, and certainly more than a billion dollars later, um, they have the bank uh, evaluations have actually finally had to recognize that um, although a lot of money was spent and many local bridges and roads were built and so on, and there was some benefit in terms of wages paid to people for public works, but that's a very old trick, um, the idea that it would change villagers' ways of being and that they would make new accountable and participatory practices their own did not work, did not happen and still has not happened. So that was um, you know, a, a, a massive effort to use ethnographic knowledge to really come up with something that was very finely tuned. But in the end, um, people turn out to have other ideas. And of course, what that design overlooks is the entire system of patronage and uh, you know, what I have in another publication called the project system, like all the incentives that there are when money flows towards villages and the characteristic ways in which that project fund is distributed left, right, up, down and sideways. And the objective of this project was to cut all of that out. Like you want to cut off all of what was defined as corruption or leakage in order to catapult the money directly from the bank to the villages. Um, but then you cut out the incentives for most people to be involved at all, right? So it's not surprising that this kind of system is going to be um, you know, either sabotaged or, or set aside or in some way or other is not actually going to be able to be, it won't, it won't be able to make the radical change it attempted to make, which was uh, you know, really intervening into those kinds of hierarchical and project-driven relations. Okay, so um, just briefly, that's sort of the main outlines of the book. So briefly in terms of the uptake, um, since the book was published. So when I first presented this um, to NGOs in Indonesia, I had a couple of workshops that, were, that were organized um, by the Ford Foundation and some other groups that I have known for a long time. They organized some workshops to discuss the book. And initially the NGOs were a bit, um, a bit startled by my positioning of them uh, in a series with other trustees. So the idea that when NGOs are busy in villages, they too are governing in the sense of Foucault, right? They too have a concept of what's wrong with village life and how it should be shaped up or improved. Villages should be more democratic. They should be doing community agriculture. They should uh, not be jumping into cocoa, but they should be doing 
agroforestry, like basically, you know, NGOs too, in various ways, are also experts and trustees with their own concepts of how people should behave. So that was initially a bit startling to them because they're used to seeing themselves as the opposite, you know, as, as the allies and advocates of the people. So it, I think it provoked some useful um, thinking among them um, and they were really open to it. They were quite wonderful. So, well, actually what you say is true. We should think more about our own practices, like how democratic are we? How often do we check back with the people in whose name we're doing all of this stuff to see does it fit with what they want? Are we asking them? You know, do we uh, actually have the democratic uh, ethos which uh, we think we have, but in fact may often neglect in favor of you know, getting projects done and so on? So that was one kind of um, response. Um, the Nature Conservancy, uh, I had some private correspondence with them, but the um, rather shocking thing is that about two months ago I got an email from someone who's working as a consultant for the Nature Conservancy they're saying they're beginning to work in the same park area and they're planning a bunch of things exactly the same as what they did um, two decades ago. So um, the lack, and they didn't even have an archive. Uh, they didn't even have the documents to show that what they were doing was a repeat. So one of their consultants had read my book, she contacted me. I had to photocopy my whole archive of TNC documents and send it to her so that she could you know, try to work with her project team to say, look guys, you know, we're not on a clean slate here. Um, and there was, she was having an uphill struggle actually to persuade them to read anything or to be at all interested in what had gone on before because they were so convinced that whatever mess up that was, um, they were not gonna mess up and it would go so much better this time around. Um, for the World Bank, that was the most tricky kind of thing because um, the people who designed this project, although I certainly did not surprise them, I had given them a draft of the chapter, they knew what was coming, but I think they felt um, not just startled, but a bit offended by it. Um, but that was, I, I think, for me, that was a, it, was, it was difficult. Personally, it was tense because some of these people are my friends. Um, but I think what it came down to is that, uh, you know, I was not questioning their intelligence or their expertise. I was basically stating what is intrinsic to their position. Like, if you are inside in an agency like the World Bank, you have to program, right? You have to render technical, you have to come up with projects and solutions. The one that they came up with was fantastically creative. Nothing like it had ever been tried before and I admired their commitment and their stamina. But at the end of the day, it's still a project, it's still a massive intervention, it's a billion dollars in funds. And you know they too should be held to account for that. It's not a small thing when you intervene on that scale in someone else's country, according to a logic, um, you know which one could uh, which one can scrutinise. And the fact that uh, it did not actually work, as we now know, you know, a decade later, um, I'm not saying I told you so, because it really isn't so much. My critique wasn't so much about the results. It was more about scrutinising the relation of power in which you know, your technical matrix comes to direct people's lives and funds on such a scale. Um, so that was, a, you know, a tense relationship. I think we made, we made up, but, uh, you know, one can understand why practitioners could feel um, that my book is a big challenge. And I've had several emails from people working as in development who said, I read your book, that's my life, ouch. You know, as in, it's painful. You know, it's painful to be confronted with, the, you know, with a sort of a, an expose of the intrinsic limits of this kind of intervention. They're not limits due to stupidity, uh, or sometimes they are, but mostly they're not. They're limits due to what is it to intervene? You know, what, in what can you intervene? And what does intervention actually require in terms of defining a technical field and mostly uh, you know ruling out many of the important things that you should be uh, perhaps considering intervening in. So um, last part of this talk what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about what what I have have been following since then. So this came out uh, in 20, 2007 and um, of course the development machine has not stopped and I think what I caught when I was doing this work on the World Bank project, you know, it was probably around 2003, 2004, because, you know, books take a while. 
to come out even, um, has intensified. And what I now see more clearly than I think I did then, you know, I call that last chapter of the book um, Development in the Age of Neoliberalism. And what I was thinking was that, you know, I was usually using the concept of advanced liberalism as in, not so much as in the expansion of capitalism, but in the expansion of forms of governing which work through incentives, which work through trying to sort of, you know, they're very difficult. It's about optimizing, the, changing the conditions under which people work, um, under which people live, offering kind of carrots and sticks, getting the incentives right uh, as a way to um, change the world. So that kind of, uh, that kind of finely tuned intervention, which I um, identified, I, I now see it a bit more clearly in historical terms, being nudged, um, gently nudged by Henry Bernstein, uh, development uh, scholar, who said that, you know, who, who read the book and he said, well, really what you've described in this will to improve is a technical arena. He, he said it's, it's actually a bit characterizes the last 30, 40 years, but he disputed whether it really uh, characterized as much, let's say the 1950s and 60s, when uh, development scholars were working with governments to debate the big pattern of development, you know, socialist past versus capitalist past versus um, nationalist past, import substitution, you know, the, the whole shape of economy and society was often being debated in a context where there were in fact understood to be alternatives. And so um, he says, you know, that that's what development was and that's what development knowledge was, what in fact development advice was about in that period. Um, but then since the 1980s, under neoliberal orthodoxy, um, the, the suggestion is that governments, you know, the suggestion was and actually still is, that governments should not try to plan or manage national development, but trust in markets to deliver growth and welfare for all. So, you know, the kind of the, the collapse of national planning um, in favor of, you know, market processes. But ironically, as um, Bernstein observes, he said, it's in the neoliberal period that transnational development agencies and some national governments are in fact doing more. So rather than doing less, um, so in fact, he says, ironically, what they are doing is more and more about less and less. So the big picture, you know, the big trajectory of development of an economy is kind of out of control or left to the market, but many new er areas of concern have come up. So for example, um, you know, development agencies are now worried about environmental protection, gender equity, good governance, public participation, human rights, climate preparedness. Like there's no shortage actually of issues of concern um, in which development agencies are now uh, busily involved. So it's not as if neoliberal development meant the end of intervention. It meant its deflection into a whole you know, range of kind of subtopics. So looking back, I mean, that's really what I caught the beginning of that wave, that World Bank project would be a good example of that. A billion dollars on trying to make villages more participatory is a little bit of a strange thing, right? Unless you understand it you know, in the context of, um, you, know, you, you tinker with or you try to intervene in these social things because the major direction of the economy is something in which you're not going to intervene at all. So um, what are some of the new technical arena then? Um, on the one hand, land, uh, I would say that you know, the, 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 the development apparatus has moved into territories which were once thought, ironically, to be too political. So one of them is land governance. I, back in the 90s and 2000s when I was writing this, um, there was a more hesitation to intervene, to intervene in that field, except perhaps through titling programs. Um, but now uh, the World Bank and other agencies are involved in promoting land governance agendas, um, uh, codes for responsible investment. Like basically the whole land arena is being rendered technical, rendered into something in which if only you have the right stakeholders and the right processes and the right documents, you know, you can somehow 
work it all out in a kind of multi-stakeholder way, which doesn't involve um, political confrontation. So one might think, you know, land is something over which revolutions have been fought and people have died. But now I would say la this idea of land governance attempts to make it into a technical arena in which if only you can get all the pieces lined up correctly, uh, you, can, you can work it all out. Another example, the one, one which really intrigued me, um, is politics. So I read, uh, I read a World Bank study in 2016 called Making Politics Work for Development. And I thought, well, that's interesting because, you know, we've been writing about the anti-politics machine, you know, development. In fact, the World Bank is explicitly forbidden by its charter from intervening in politics, right? That, that's supposed to be off, the, off their limit. So what is a World Bank study called Making Politics Work for Development actually about? And it turns out that um, there's now a sense that um, uh, political processes, especially electoral processes, um, are important and they can in fact be intervened in technically. So um, what, they, what the, this project, what this uh, paper uh, report proposes is that you should identify elements of good political practice, namely transparency, voting, and voice. And then you should figure out how to encourage those good practices and therefore presumably discourage bad ones, like you know, voting for your ethnic chief or voting you know, in terms of patronage or some other you know, illegitimate criteria. So the, the technical intervention was to give people data it was using, to give people the right information so that when they're choosing between electoral candidates, they wouldn't just listen to what someone was saying, you know, we're going to solve your problems, we're going to, you know, improve your schools. You would have data which would show, like last time this guy was in power, like did he or did he not, you know, improve schooling? And, and numbers would show. So basically the idea is that, you know, you use data to educate people so that they will then make the right choice. And in this way, you can direct them away from irresponsible politicians and towards the responsible ones. So it's quite intriguing, right? Because it, it's, it's, like, it's like a technical intervention in the arena of politics in the, in, with the hope that you can actually use electoral processes to produce beneficial results and um, minimize the negative ones. So I thought that was pretty intriguing. Um, one of the uh, interesting things about the, pro the report, though, was a sort of salutary note, uncharacteristic, I think, for bank reports, which said, at the end of the day, um, you cannot change history, uh, which is something that development agencies often think they can do, right? They often act in ignorance of history because they think you can just treat it as a clean slate and move forward. But... Um, this report recognized that political traditions, you know, uh, voting traditions, relations between, uh, you know, leaders, elected leaders and the people often have histories, you know, laid down in liberation struggles or revolutions or other kinds of historical events which deeply color what people actually expect of political processes. And that's not something that can just be changed overnight. So I, that really spoke home to me because in my experience in Indonesia, um, I find that people have extremely low expectations of their government um, and so they put up with all kinds of terrible things because they don't actually think that their government is there to serve them. Um, so, but in other contexts, equally poor, they do think that, right? And so there is a different, the, these different political cultures, I think, begin to really um, make a difference. So the last uh, arena um, that I just want to mention is uh, the tendency today in development interventions to become uh, ever more technical in terms of the concept of audit and what's sometimes called management by results. So when it's now routine for established development agencies, but also new actors like social funds, philanthrocapitalist foundations like the Gate Foundation, um, they, want, they demand numbers as proof of efficiency. They see themselves as investors, you know, willing to invest in the cause of the poor, but wanting to know that their money is well spent. So if funds come attached with this kind of demand for investor accountability, you know, not just with the mon was the money stolen, but did it actually produce the results that were promised, of course, that kind of demand for accountability is going to work backwards into the kinds of projects which can now be imagined, right? Certain kinds of intervention 
are more likely to produce an auditable, quantifiable result of the kind that can make the funding agency uh, continue to pay, whereas other kinds of intervention will not, right? So you can see that how that kind of demand for audit and accountability has intensified, and that is going to have an effect on program design. So one area where that's really become very clear is um, programs, uh, first of all, the whole field of development, experimental uh, development economics. Uh, the people who work, like my son is a development economist, although he doesn't do this kind of thing, but um, you know, experimental design, uh, controlled trials, give half the children deworming pills and get, don't give it to the other half of the children and see what is the effect in school attendance or something like that, right? So experimental methods which aim, which aim to have a quantified proof that money was actually well spent and uh, produces a good result. Micronutrients is another. So these are, one could say, the ultimate of rendering technical, but they're also the ultimate about doing more and more about less and less. Like if development has become a matter of um, a micronutrient pill or a deworming pill, then you don't need to worry about the quality of food, people's incomes, their land, their production. You know, many of the, what one might think of as the big development questions get sidelined in favor of the focus on these very technical, specific kinds of intervention which can produce quantified results. So I think this, this kind of thing could um, produce a lot of cynicism, um, but I try not to do that. I, I think that uh, in place of cynicism, what I have advocated and still advocate is what I call in the book um, you know, a practice of politics in which my subjects are involved, you know, village critics, but in which we should also, uh, and usually are involved, um, you know, which has to do with permanent vig vigilance. Like we should always be asking, rather as I did in my lecture yesterday about land reform, we should always be asking, why is this the picture? You know, why are these the processes in which we're intervening and not these other ones? You know, what, what, uh, what has been assembled here for us to see and contemplate and what has been set aside? Um, those are questions that I think we should always ask because what they enable us to do is to not only offer critique but also to um, disable a kind of complacency which says, uh, well, this is the best that we can do. Uh, a situation, uh, you know, uh, a response which I don't think we should accept, right? We should be and could be doing so much more. So whenever we're confronted with a solution which seems to us um, from our position as critics insufficient, we should be saying that. We should be exposing that. It doesn't mean to say we always have to have the answer. And that was one of, peop some people criticized my book for that saying, you know, get off your high horse, you know, get off your stage and uh, tell us what therefore we should do. But I actually argue and I still believe that um, we have to keep these roles distinct. You know, the role of a critic is a separate role. And as Foucault said, you know, it's not my job to lay down the law for the law. And it's not his job to fix the prisons, right? That wasn't his project. But a critical project which tries to ask what is this will to improve? Why are these the targets? How is it actually working? Seems one, to me one which has its own value, um, which isn't reduced or judged by the question of, does it therefore have an answer to every question? I think it's more, that's why I say it's more a question of constant vigilance, you know, always being on it, you know, in terms of what new is emerging, what can we make of this? How can we um, understand the conjuncture in which we're living um, and, you know, make that kind of critical thinking widely available. So hopefully the French translation will uh, help with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This very uh, lively, uh, clear and challenging uh, talk. I very much share your last comments about <laughs> where do we stand when we critique a development project. You know, it's not... We, we, we may be in a position to tell people what, what not to do, what to avoid, but maybe not in a position to tell them what to do exactly, because <laughs> otherwise it would be a bit tricky. And I'm sure that many of us in the room here have heard uh, some of the situation that sounds very familiar 
to different fields we we all be involved so i pass on to the the room for some uh, question and comments and i thank you again maybe i will start with a sort of comment general but not not very long just a few points that i find very interesting for for the discussion um, maybe the first one is about this idea of rendering technical, which is really a sort of thread of all the history of intervention in the colonial era and in the development era. Um, what I find very interesting is what we s you said in the end with this report from, from the World Bank about rendering politics technical. So the idea of depoliticizing uh, politics in a way, that's, that's, that's big. <laughs> and depoliticizing political words such as such as uh, empowerment, participation, and participation, it's a political term normally. Um, but what I wanted to stress, maybe there is something about rendering technical which has a sort of geographical or topographical di dimension, and that could be interesting to, you, you say that in the book, but it's not completely uh, theorized or you are not a geographer so that's normal but you know all this story about resettlement relocalization villagization of people or uprooting in a way of people and transporting them to one point to another point that's very interesting because part of the rendering technical is is geographic in a way so displacing people and um, but there is a sort of exception which could be the, the last project you described in your book, so the KDP, so the World Bank project, because they, want, they wanted at the beginning, but it did not happen, they wanted to reform all the, all the, all the Indonesian society, so they didn't want to relocate people, but to transform society from, from, from the bottom up, as you said. So in that case, there is no relocalization, there is no... this topography of, of a rendering technical but anyway I think it's a, it could be interesting to have this kind of geographical or topographical approach to this way of rendering things technical the way of dividing also the landscape between the conservation area and area for intensified farming for instance so this, this direction could be could be I don't know interesting um, another point is about development and the will to improve. So I think that you're right in, in, in having used this idea of will to improve rather than development because it, it allows you to, to, to have this long-term perspective on the colonization, post-colonial era. So that's very interesting. Um, so maybe the question would be about the, 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 the currency of the idea of development. Are we in a, in a, in a post-development era or is it, is it a kind of historical term? development or do we still talk about development i don't know i think that we could start with a definition by for instance jean-pierre chauveau who says that development is where there is there are people saying that they are doing development so do we have still people doing <laughs> saying they are doing development that could be a good question but about the will to improve um, so there is a linkage you made with neoliberalism and you discussed it at the end of your, your talk um, but if we, if, we, if we think about neoliberalism in terms of the combination of security plus individual responsibility, maybe we have to, to think another way of, of seeing this idea of the will to improve because there is the idea of imposing the uh, sort of internalization of the will to improve to the people who are supposed to change on this basis. So it's completely different from the colonial way to imposing this will to improve or even to the, to the development era. So I think there is maybe a transformation of this idea of will to improve, even though I think that the expression is still, is still uh, functioning. Um, what else? And yes, and uh, if, you, if you consider the fact that in the world of, let's say, development, you have new actors such as uh, big corporation, multinational companies, uh, are they motivated by the will to improve or do they use this tool, local development and so on, for other things? So the will to be, <laughs> to be quiet and to do business, for instance. So to what extent can you apply this idea of will to improve to co big corporation doing development? And maybe the last point is about what you said about uh, we cannot be critics and participants. So I At don't know. At the same time. At the same, yeah, Maybe okay. on a different day, but yeah. not at the same no, time. No, that, that's true. Yeah. No, is that because I was thinking of the, uh, about the book of David Moss yeah. that was published more or less at the same time. Yeah. 
yeah. your book, and it was different because he, he had different positions during the, the, the mm. trajectory of the project he studied. Um, because sometimes he was in, sometimes he was out. And, and it caused him a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah. and in the end the reception yeah. was very bad, because <laughs> even worse <laughs> than for you, because you, you, you were an academic from the beginning until mm. the end, so I think that, make, that makes a difference. Yeah. Maybe in a way it's, it's easier. <laughs> And, um, but uh, I think there is something about the fact that there was uh, in the review or the panel review that was, which was published by geographers in 2010, there was a comment by Anthony Bevington saying that there was maybe a sort of lack of symmetry in your approach, so you, uh, or sort of asymmetry. So that means that you, you were very precise in the details of the strategies of the local people uh, were imposed development and uh, the approach of development intervention was more through text and documents and not that much through participant observation so there was a sort of methodological asymmetry and it has maybe there is a link between this asymmetry and this positionality which was always outside the, the world of development it's not a critique, but I think it's, it's, could be a, it's, a, it's a good topic to discuss. Okay, great. Okay, that's enough. Such interesting comments. Thank you, uh, Pierre. Would you like me to, um, to respond to, to that? Or I don't know. It depends on maybe others want to um, add something on these topics, or, or you can just start to... Just okay, uh, can you move it? Yeah? I s okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, so rendering, starting at the beginning, rendering technical <coughs> as a sort of thread um, of the book and the extent to which there's a kind of a topographical element to that because some of the examples, especially in earlier on in the book, involve kind of physical relocation, resettlement. So what was interesting to me, first of all, was that the purpose of resettlement was always, in the examples that I uh, followed, was absolutely social. I and mean, the idea was that by removing people from their original location, not only would you replace them in, in a new location, but that relocation would in itself force them to change everything else. So in a way, it was a sort of the shortcut to the, so the total social engineering, simply by removing people from the area where their ancestors were buried, where the spirits lived, where their enemies were next door, you know, their kin, uh, etc. You would break all those old relations and habits, modes of thinking, spiritual connections and so on. And then in a new place, you would be obliged to develop an entirely new set, so to your new surroundings. So the purpose of the relocation wasn't just to physically re relocate, it was also to change the society. So that was what was interesting to me. That it was, the relocation was the vehicle. It was the instrument for the social transformation rather than the objective uh, by itself. Uh, so, I, but I, I, I don't think that this idea of, of rendering technical is, is kind of limited to that. That was why I've been interested to see as I followed, and as you say, in the World Bank project, but uh, others subsequently, like, you know, deworming pills and intervening in politics. I mean, it seems that this could be, uh, this isn't limited to kind of physical interventions uh, of that kind, that this idea of what is being rendered technical um, for what reason, um, you know, is something that I think is all around us. An example I often give to our students when I'm talking about this is, you know, we, we too are being subject to this, right? So I get, I get an email from my university administration saying, you know, we are holding um, lunchtime workshops on work-life balance. And I think, are you kidding me? There's a whole department of this university which is busy worrying about my work-life balance and do I have it correct or not? And wants to, you know, educate and encourage me to improve upon it. And of course, I am thereby being responsibilized because if I delete the email saying, who has time for work-life balance? I'm in fact, you know, confirming my need for this intervention, etc. right? So, you know, we're all subject to the will to improve um, and we all become critics, right? Because my, I immediately have a critical reaction which says, are you kidding? <laughs> um, but also amazement. You mean there's a whole department of people 
who do this, whose job it is to worry. Why are they worrying about this thing? There's so many things you could worry about in the world, and why is it my work-life balance? That's one of them, right? So you, know, you can make yourself curious about how we are governed, and then at the techniques through which we are governed, really in any arena, it's more like a, a stance, right? It's a critical stance which always asks the question, um, you know, what kind of person am I being encouraged to be? You know, a healthy person, a good mother, a good teacher, you know, so many, so many things are demanded of us and often they don't add up, right? Um, but we as subjects of all of this improvement and all of this goodwill um, become aware that they don't add up and that one thing is in contradiction with another and so that's what enables us to be critics. So I, I don't think one should um, certainly only see this in terms of kind of you know, geographic or physical intervention, intervening upon the person uh, and on our, you know, as Foucault said, you know, the conduct of conduct, it's our conduct which is being intervened in. And for the, for the missionaries, the, the relocation was the tool of it. So when you ask, I'm just going to jump ahead, um, you know, it, where, whether the, this kind of internalization and responsabilization that we think of as a specifically neoliberal technique, uh, it was very interesting to me how close to that the missionaries were. These Dutch missionaries in 1910, they actually, uh, for different reasons, right, they had the belief that you cannot force people to accept the Christian faith. This is only something which can come from someone's own will and volition and actually has to come from their own cultural understanding. That was why they were called missionary anthropologists because they had to do all this ethnographic study to understand people so that they could lead them to, of their own volition, accept the faith. So how do you do that? Like, how do you make someone want something? It's not, you can't just force them. You, they, they were absolutely opposed to conversion by force. Um, it, to them, this, was, this made no sense. Like, you could not convert by force. So they had, you could say, a very neoliberal problem, which is how to change the set of desires, how to how to create a new environment in which people would come to this faith from their own realization that this was indeed you know, a true and a better way to live. And so for them, the relocation, the resettlement was the vehicle which loosened up their old ways of thinking and made them seem less relevant and therefore allowed space for them to come voluntarily and from their own understanding of their new situation towards the faith. So in that sense, you know, this idea of kind of working on, uh, on working through someone assumed to be autonomous, and this is one of the points that Foucault always emphasized, right, that, that the subject always has power, you know, is subject to and has power. And so it, for him it was about action on actions. And if you are coercing or forcing um, you are acting more like a sovereign, you know, you shall live, you shall die, I can impose my will on you by force. So one thing I do in the book, in the introductory chapter, is actually look at these things together, you know, force versus governing, you know, the, the force of the sovereign versus governmental kinds of techniques. And what I argue is that these things often work uh, together. So certainly for the missionaries, they work together, right? They had to forcibly resettle the army, the Dutch army, uh, well, in fact, the Dutch recruited Indonesian army, um, forced the resettlement, you had to first use force so that you could then work upon people's own, toward, towards their own comprehension. So that would be one example where, you know, one is the instrument of the other. I would say even the World Bank's project, you know, it's carrots and sticks. If you want the money, you must conform to the rules of the project. No one's forcing you if you don't want the money, do your own thing, right? There is no force there, but you can say there's a kind of a coercion in the sense that um, they do want the money, right? And they perhaps do feel they need the money. Therefore, um, you know, there's both a coercion and uh, it's a carrot and a stick. Of course, it's a gentle kind of stick, right? It has to do with what appear to be autonomous decisions, but which are actually taking place in an environment which is configured to make certain, as you know, for causes again, like certain courses of action become easier and other courses of action 
become more difficult, right? You don't actually force, but you change the terrain to encourage some kinds of action and discourage others. So I think it's very interesting, as you say, to, to look both at the kind of, you know, what was the role of like a physical intervention, even a forceful intervention, in relation to this ongoing uh, governing, which I think actually is older than the neoliberal moment. I think it was actually going on throughout the colonial period in different ways. But maybe at that point it would be interesting to re-inject the third point of the triangle discipline. Yeah. Because and not only in terms of force, but in terms of how to internalize or to make internalized a yes. <laughs> new way of, uh, of behaving. That's right. I think yes. a uh, missionary intervention, for instance. That's true. So I, I, in the introduction to the book, I do kind of give that third part of the triangle. And, th and that we see in some of these um, highly detailed techniques. So resettlement would be one of those where, you know, at least initially, it was like being in a prison camp. You know, the people who had been resettled were under total surveillance of the missionaries, um, not allowed to return to their old homes. Um, so there was a, a sort of, oops, a prison-like um, disciplinary element. But the idea was that this was educative. The purpose wasn't permanent discipline, but to, once you had sufficiently instilled these new practices, then the people of their own volition would become self-governing and then you could govern in a liberal manner. So one of the interesting things about the colonial period was, and I show this in chapter one, is the debate about whether the natives would always need to be subject to discipline. Basically, um, they were permanent children who would always require the benevolent and coercive uh, concern of the colonial state. Uh, they, they could not graduate. They would not become autonomous, responsible subjects who could be ruled in a liberal way. And uh, many people have written about this in the colonial era. Um, Uday Mehta writes about this in India. Um, what does he call it? The, the liberal government, oh, liberalism's exclusions, I, I forget the title of it, but basically looking at this tension between, you know, British pretensions to liberalism and their imposition of um, a permanent tutelary regime, which is, 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 is expected to be permanently disciplinary, because at the end of the day, these will always be children. So there's a racialized dimension which really highlights the disciplinary configuration. So thanks for bringing that in, because that, that is part of the argument of the book. I just didn't really highlight it today. Um, in terms of the, uh, the question of what really uh, motiva motivates uh, actors, new actors like um, corporations and these other actors that are being uh, interject injected. You know, this question of motivation is always one that I think carefully about because um, you know, if you go back to the critiques of development which were around when I was a student, like in the 80s, um, the, the critique of development was in terms of interests. The idea was that um, actually this is a big sham. You know, it's really about Western countries, Northern countries dominating and, and continuing to extract from poor ones and all this talk of development is, um, is false, right? It's basically, it's what I call the model of the real and the mask. The mask is, yes, we're here to help you. The real is we're here to exploit and extract from you. And so, you, so the, the tone of critique of the time is, well, we just got to take away the mask and then we'll know what's really going on. So the whole of the development, you know, what you could call will to improve is nothing but a sham because what's really going on is extraction. And uh, the first person, I think, you know, the, the most brilliant early critique of that that I read was, of course, Jim Ferguson's book, where he says, actually, most development projects are cost centers, not <coughs> profit centers. They don't actually produce, um, they don't, very often they don't change uh, farming or land or people's lives in a way that would benefit capital. So often they don't change them at all, actually, or if they do, they do it in ways which are highly indirect. So he basically questioned the idea that you could unmask development in terms of hidden interests and hidden intentions. He said, you've you got you to take it seriously because it does things, but you also can't really take it seriously and examine it if you dismiss it too fast and say, 
Well, I'm not even going to bother to look at the development apparatus because I know it's all fake and what's really going on is something else. Right? So I, what I, my premise in the book was to say, let's take this thing seriously, following Ferguson. Let's, ta for, let's take the will to improve at its word and say, there is this will. For several centuries, all kinds of interventions have been made you know, in the name of the well-being <coughs> of the population. Um, let, us, let us at least provisionally take that as true and therefore look at its forms, you know, why these forms of intervention, you know, why these prescriptions, etc. None of that analysis is possible if you dismiss the apparatus from the beginning, right? Um, because you, you know it's kind of hidden agenda. Of course, one doesn't need to be naive, right? And say that therefore, there aren't also very, you know, nefarious projects which have extractive objectives. And so, um, you know, there, there's a sort of a midpoint between um, trying to do a serious analysis of what this apparatus is, how it works, what it does, versus saying, um, everything that happens in the name of development is, um, you know, is benevolent or has certainly has benevolent effects. But, uh, so sorry, I agree for mm -hmm. the idea of taking seriously the idea of the will to improve it. If not, we, can, we cannot see anything. But uh, maybe the difference between a state or development and agency on the one hand and a corporation on yeah. the other hand, that the, the normal thing for a state is to, to do good because right. they are supposed to do that right. and right. corporation is supposed to do business. Right. So there is a sort of mimetism or mimetic discourse on yes. the side of corporations, which is interesting to study also, to, to take seriously, but to study, yes. because it's not the same starting point. Yes, anyway. I agree. Um, so I think the, um, you know, to some extent, it's, I don't know, I mean, maybe it's an empirical question. I mean, I, there was some of the interesting work that came out. There was one book that was written in the context of the land grab debate some years ago. I think it was a journalist. I can't remember the guy's name. And he had actually gone around interviewing um, farm managers and directors of corporations to, to really ask them, like, why are you here? Like, why are you here, you know, buying up land and trying to do this kind of farm in Mozambique or wherever they were? And uh, what he got was a lot of will to improve. It's like, well, we're here to bring benefit to the people. And we, you know, we heard they're short of food and we're going to grow some and they need jobs and we're bringing some. And so it was kind of remarkable the extent to which you know, the spokespeople for these corporations were actually um, full of, of uh, this will, right? full of this idea that they were bringing beneficial development um, to the people. Um, so I think that kind of will is actually probably quite widespread, and I assume there's a certain amount of, or a lot of cynicism as well, right? So, you know, it would be hard to really know, you know, the proportions. Um, I think what's particularly interesting is something like the Gates Foundation, you know, because they're, uh, you know, clearly Mr. Gates is not short of money, so he's not mm. necessarily, you know, trying to enrich himself. And I think he probably has an enormous will to improve. You know, he, he wants to do this, mm. but he, he positions himself as a businessman in the sense that he wants bang for the buck, right? He wants value for his money. And so, you know, for him, this will to improve is like show, it's a business model, you know, which wants to actually show that. And then there's a, another kind of corporate thing, you know, I'm sure everywhere that we all work, you know, corporate social responsibility has also come up. So I mentioned this briefly in my, election, in my lecture yesterday, but I was really interested in the work that the Rights and Resources Institute is doing on what they call the business case for um, getting the land relations right. And it's a business case, they're making it in business terms and they're basically saying if you mess this up and the people get angry and there's a big media spectacle and they burn down your factory or they blockade the road, you know, this is going to cost you. It's going to cost you money directly. It's going to cost uh, your insurance. They calculated your insurance premiums will go up. Your public profile will be destroyed. Once the NGOs get on your tail, uh, even if you try to make amends, basically it's over, you know, you'll never be able to fix something like this. So basically, you know, painting a business case um, for why corporations should try to do the right thing, not on moral grounds, but on business grounds. Right? So I think this, this question you're asking about how is this will 
you know, part of some of these iterations, you know, maybe in a minor key, um, you know, alongside other kinds of uh, other kinds of concerns. Uh, that's I think that would be that's an important you know analysis, as you say, because the, you know the cast of characters, the actors, have expanded. I would say in Indonesia, the government, the people are very unlikely to believe the will to improve on the part of the government. They, they would be most cynical about that because they would say, well, they always say these things. They say they want to bring us all kinds of benefits, but actually it's just for themselves. They just want the project funds, right? They, they're highly cynical about their own government. But that's not universal, right? That's a bit of an Indonesian problem, I think. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't like to speak. <laughs> it's quite common. <laughs> right. Right. So just, just to add up, just the last point, and then we, you know, we, can, we can come back. Um, th this question of, of the, uh, the different positions, um, like me versus David Moss, for example. Um, so it, you know, we obviously we know each other, and, and it was very interesting when we were both working on these books, because um, you know, he did have a very different position. Uh, and as you know, for him, the really challenging thing was <coughs> moving from the inside to the outside. And he wrote a brilliant essay about this called um, For an Antisocial Anthropology, where he really spells out very clearly um, how anthropology requires kind of rapport and closeness as a condition of data. And then you have to effectively step to the other side of the table and say, now we'll have distance because I'm going to write about you. And you know, David really explored how that's not a fault, like that's intrinsic to the enterprise. And in fact, it's the ambiguity of the word ethnography includes both of those, right? Because you know, we think of ethnography as the field work, but ethnography <coughs> is also the written product, right? And these are the results of extremely different kinds of relationships, um, even though you know, it's part of one enterprise. So he analyzed that in a very, very insightful way. And I, I often recommend it to my students who are inside outside. Students often come to me who worked in development and become cynical. And they say, uh, you know, come and work with Tanya because I'll help them to think through, you know, what was this thing they were working on, how to reflect on it, etc. But what, you know, sometimes people who worked for NGOs, people often come to study with me who already have a practitioner background of some kind. And then they find uh, crossing to the other side of the table very difficult because they often feel that they're being disloyal to their friends and to the organization and they don't want to break relationships and obviously for David it was hugely painful because these were his friends and they ended up um, very uh, upset with him because he wrote about them uh, even though they had given their permission etc cetera, etc cetera. but when they actually saw what he wrote and saw themselves and their processes characterized um, they were not happy about it so um, to me, this is, it, it is an interesting dilemma. And um, the reason why I use only documents in the chapter on the World Bank is because I knew that there would be these sensitivities and I had a private correspondence. In fact, it was the bank of officials who sent me all the documents because they wanted my input. And so I gave it to them in as helpful a way as I could. Um, so I tried to be collegial, but at the end of the day I was going to write about it, which they knew, although of course they couldn't anticipate quite what I would come up with. Um, but I decided not to use any of our internal correspondence, only to use the published documents. I thought, you know, that's more than enough, you know, there's a lot to go on here. Let's not, let's not sort of get into the backroom chat, let's just say this is what the documents reveal. And so um, I was, you know, not only Tony, but the other protagonists asked me about that. Like, well, if you spent more time hanging out with us, you would know we're the good guys. And I said, well, of course I know you're the good guys. I don't question your intelligence or your benevolence. This is a characteristic of your position. And in fact, it was better to analyze it from the documents. And one of them actually said to me, how, how naive are you to pay so much attention to documents? Don't you know that documents are just paper we have to produce? And I said, you know, at the end of the day, a billion dollars was transferred and spent on the basis of this series of documents. So you can't tell me the documents are nothing. I'm sure they're not everything, and every document has a backstory, but they themselves are actors in the world. Right? A document 
is what enables a chain of funds. And so I'm going to take your documents seriously and analyze them um, from that perspective. So there was, a bit of a, there was a bit of a reason for why there isn't more kind of a personal chat in that chapter. I think it would be, of course, an you know, interesting project to do, and David himself has done this, including with the same team, right? He spent some time with the social capital people at the World Bank trying to understand, you know, really, you know, to try to give a sympathetic understanding of the, of the huge constraints they were under. Like, that team is, like, way on the left wing of the bank. So, you know, they, they, they were trying to do things which were far more social, far more... Um, socially ambitious, um, and so uh, you know he was trying to understand the institutional environment uh, in which they were innovators and sort of pushing the envelope of what could be done within the bank in quite a kind of an original way. So you know, and it, many things can be studied, but that was actually the reason why it turned out that way. Yes. Oh yeah, but um, inside, outside, yes. Yeah, so like I said, I think these, these, I, I think these should be these positions should be kept distinct, and I, uh, I think one could uh, one could occupy one position on one day and one on another, or at different stages of a career. I don't think you can occupy them simultaneously, in the sense that if you, and I have said this several times, if I had had to end that book with a prescription, this now is what you should do. That obligation to come up with a doable uh, new kind of project would have infected the entire preceding text, right? Because you then have to write the whole thing to lead up to this result. Mm -hmm. And any of you who've written, who've done consulting, as I have occasionally, to me it has a sort of a visceral effect. I can physically feel it. It's like, <laughs> okay, I've got to come up with something which they can actually do. And so and I want them to do the most progressive thing imaginable. So I have to know what's within the realm of imaginable and possible for these people with these resources and this institutional location. And how can I come up with an analysis which would support the best, most progressive thing that could actually realistically happen? But you're writing backwards, right? You're, you're then writing, and that's exactly what all development projects do, right? They already know the prescription and they're writing backwards for the analysis. Um, so had I had that obligation, I couldn't have written the book, right? You know, you have to be able to stand far enough back to really scrutinize the entire enterprise, which you can't do if you are inside the enterprise. Um, but I do think, you know, hat switching is a good exercise, right? Because it does give you more insight into the practices and the constraints. So you, you were saying something earlier about something, some parallel uh, experience that you had. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah I, was really, uh, sorry. I was really inspired by your book mm -hmm. and I used it deeply for my PhD. That was on the, my, my field work was in Senegal, working on a dairy business, social business, uh, owned by and uh, led by Danone, a multinational group. Yeah. And so, uh, and so, the mm, rendering, rendering technical was a, a main strategy for for the company to enroll uh, and use public uh, public uh, donor funds uh, to have also a kind of uh, support from the sugarcane uh, business in a, that was in place uh, to. Uh, to work on uh, improvement of uh, livestock keeping uh, by with uh, the NGOs support, but so that was a kind of the intensification was the kind of catalyst catalyzer of these dynamics. So they are well, mainly uh, people uh, there pastoralists. They intensify because they had no choice. Uh, they they lost. They have lost the access to to the to the human to the river valley resources. They were dispossessed by the sugarcane companies and other agrobusinesses that are put in place there. So they, they were they were obliged to intensify, and uh, and it was so difficult for them to intensify more. And so they didn't they didn't do that. 
they do other things. Uh, their their goals there was not to were not to um, to try to stabilize their their cattle and produce more milk uh, during the dry season, for example. They they incur they use the intervention of the dairy groups to support and to diversify their systems and to and to better survive in a in a very um, in a very bad environment for them when agrobusiness is spreading up uh, quite uh, and um, it's really important and social business and uh, uh, enterpri enterprise responsibility is really important there They're, all the companies are moving to the, towards this because of the NGOs contestation the land uh, is very is very contested uh, so yeah, I and also so I saw also the company, for example, using nutrients, uh, distributing for for some people and not the others, some yogurts that were fortified and uh, with vitamins, and then after uh, organizing with research center, uh, try to test and uh, to have uh, information on the prevalence of diseases or malnutrition, something like this that were used to con to build these narratives this uh, and so I'm, I'm yeah I think it's very well your case studies in Indonesia your work is very actual I think uh, now what is going on in uh, in Africa is these narratives they are corporations are using the the empty uh, the empty well the fact that the states are very ineffective to to put a uh, development in place for people people are really cynical uh, and so they are using this this empty to yeah let's say we are the best the best actors for development because we are here we are efficient we are going to stay because we want to make money and so they they access public funds and so the hidden agenda was uh, Clear, was a clear was for Danone is it's a it's a way to create an enterprise with a very low investment, uh, create a brand, successful brand to improve their knowledge in building uh, trade uh, circuits in a very not supermarkets but everywhere in the country uh, to try to produce local milk because they know that they can do better values products with local mix they know that they are uh, they are under attack from the comp from the corporations because uh, imports of powdered milk is very important so what so gone it's uh, and so on it's very but my question was maybe a question is more on, on conflict because another uh, parallel we can do with western africa and sahelian countries now for example is that uh, we have huge conflicts pattern there. Uh, it's out of control, but this conflict is emerging now with terrorism, jihadism, uh, ins insurgencies, uh, quite everywhere. Technic taking ethnical uh, forms, uh, states supporting some militias from some people against others that are perceived to be more close to. <coughs> to jihadist group, for example, is very out of control. And it's very political. Well, I think that this kind of pattern of conflict are coming up from uh, some politics um, that are, 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 are being put in place before. And so it's, but it's, um, and World Bank is reinvesting these countries with big, huge program. Um, Based on pastoralism, focus on pastoralism, 250 million million of dollars for six countries. Well, and they are reinvesting in a technical way, as it was in your case in uh, in the book in the local development. So they, but they started and uh, they started from the idea also in uh, Indonesia, if I'm right, uh, to reduce the the level of conflict just by putting in place procedures and putting mm, money but the political analysis what's wha what was wrong and and what was wrong also because of uh, the responsibility of the work bank international institutions european union politics it's not uh, taken in account 
So it's it's uh, my question is more on on this, and it's very rare to have a statement now, but uh, that is to to make this critical uh, um, thinking recognized, even by um, even by uh, development institutions, uh, research as well is is not so so easy. So it was my question. It was in. Um, as this conflict, uh, I, I missed this dimension of conflict yesterday in your presentation uh, that was in uh, in the book, but I missed that. Uh, and uh, I was thinking, the land reform, uh, which is the relationship with this dimension of conflict that was seem seem to be used in Indonesia, and uh, the attempt uh, uh, of land reform uh, mm. from the government that is putting in place now. Mm, okay, so. In the book, uh, I do talk about conflict because um, the World Bank program was kind of already on the ground when a lot of these conflicts which came up at the end of the Suharto era erupted. And in their characteristic style, they set out to do a bunch of ethnography. So they set to researchers um, in conflict areas to try to understand um, conflict um, and their concept was again you know they're rational choice people you know they are even though the anthropologists were there I mean the, the way of thinking is very much uh, a rational choice one of incentives and so on and so they they had the idea that the potential for conflict is always present you know ethnic diversity even class um, uh, inequality in itself does not produce conflict because such inequalities and diversity is in fact everywhere all around us. So they, they steered themselves away from saying, you know, it's diversity or inequality that is the cause of conflict and looked for other triggers. So they said, well, the question then is since the potential for conflict is always present, one has to understand under what conditions does conflict actually erupt and under what conditions are these inevitable uh, tensions managed or they dissipate or they don't become an actual expression of violence. And so they tried to study uh, how this dynamic took place and they, they also, they, one of their focuses was on what they called conflict and non-conflict regions. So they went to parts of Indonesia which weren't in the middle of like a major blow up to see what was the kind of everyday violent incidents. You know, someone steals a chicken and they can be lynched um, or not, right? Under some conditions, a mob forms and violence ensues and then they get their friends and then pretty soon two villages are burning each other's houses, like a small trigger becomes what, you know, a bigger conflict. And in others, although the chicken was stolen, somebody intervenes early on and says, look guys, we should definitely get this chicken thief and we've got to make him pay, you know, he should pay a fine as well, but we're not going to go burning <coughs> each other's houses, you know, we, we don't do that kind of thing around here, right? So they got interested in conflict dynamics and they came up with a kind of technical schema of, um, you know, escalation, de-escalation, uh, what kinds of intervention at what stage were more effective. So they did their usual, very thorough kinds of ethnographic analysis with the goal of technical intervention, right? You, you could then, could you have facilitators who would be on the ground, who were trained to intervene at the trigger stage, you know, so that they could be more effective at preventing an escalation? And who would be the kinds of people who could do this and what kinds of training would they need? And would they be local uh, charismatic leaders? Would they be, um, you know, who would they be? So this was a sort of very interesting, the way they, they try to analyze conflict, not as a result of what one might think of as kind of political economic forces, you know, inequality, poverty, et cetera, but as a result of a particular kind of dynamic. Um, but they also, another part of their analysis was to say uh, conflict is anti-development, you know, in a conflict region there's no investment, there are no jobs, the economy stagnates, people become very hopeless, they're bored, they're not working, so, you know, it's sort of like a, a vicious cycle. 
And the way to intervene in that cycle is actually to invest, right? So you have to have project funds going in, people are busy, they're happy to see that the school is being rebuilt and that there's going to be a new bridge. And it's a little bit the distraction concept, you know, that if, if people see uh, helpful things happening, they will be less easily provoked the next time uh, there was a trigger incident, etc. So they sort of their idea was to intervene on both uh, angles. So I mean, again, you'd have to say extraordinary kind of analysis and also extraordinary kind of um, technical intervention, right? You know, actually thinking through how would you intervene in a conflict situation in order to change its trajectory. Um, they then got involved in uh, Afghanistan, I believe, and other conflict zones with a kind of you know, community development <coughs> type of approach. And there the idea was that you know, if you're dealing with um, a drastically dislocated civil society, people who've been, again, resettled, moved, uh, shoved around, like no longer living in the kind of village and kinship structures that they may have lived in before, um, they may lack the kinds of group which a society normally has, you know, for solidarity, for problem solving and so on. So could you use a project generated, could, could a project generate the right kind of social capital? Could you, by virtue of gathering people around this pot of money, the honeypot, get them collaborating, talking, getting to know each other, you know, crossing over suspicion, um, and you know, coming up with something to, to everyone's benefit. So could you actually effectively create society um, in a conflict situation where society was assumed to be absent? Of course, as usual, there's a caveat, um, society is never actually absent, right? It, you know, they, they got quite excited about Aceh, about the idea of building after the tsunami. Coming back to your geographic they were kind of thinking, well, all the landscape has changed, all the infrastructure has gone, the people are also dislocated, so we actually have a clean slate. Like now we can, you know, build back better, not just the infrastructure, but society. So we can, you know, instead of reproducing the old order with all its pathologies, we can start afresh with new participatory and accountable ways of doing things, right? And they were very intrigued by that idea of the tabula rasa, because it's never a tabula rasa. You know, we, we, we always have society, right? People always have their people um, or form links very quickly. Um, but it was an interesting, again, it was an interesting concept. So is that some of the kinds of things that which is going on in your research area now, like this type of attempt to intervene in conflict through sort of project mechanisms or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah absolutely uh -huh. yeah the logic is but it's um, the narratives is also built on it mm. let's say the insecurity and pastoralists are marginalized and but and they can be the um, the people they are good to occupy and to avoid that <coughs> a place yes. become a uh, um, no man's land basically that is the, yeah. the the best condition for traffics, uh, terrorists. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, that that is the narratives. So they really they are saying is not a kind of problem of citizenships because these people are citizens. Yes. This is not a kind of uh, uh, about changing our politics, our comprehension of these uh, people, of the arid environments, uh, of the responsibility, the responsibility of the politics in this situation. But it's more, we have to put money, build infrastructure, try to, to make people use tools, uh, as you say, technical tools. <coughs> well, we use to, to form, to, to instruct, for example, public servants about conflicts. You have uh, kind of key tools uh, that are very abstract uh, and are, well, not satisfactory mm. solution, in my opinion. But and it so is a kind of rendering technical of kind of conflict management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's still on this, and well, France, the, yeah. the French army is, is involved in yeah. the, in the yeah. conflict directly, supporting militias. So, yeah. so well, it's uh, really yeah. it's what is going on right. there. Right. Well. The, mm. 
I'd like to hear from, uh, yeah, so what, what, uh, what's your thoughts? In, in French? Of course. <laughs> I could do it in English, but no, uh, my, my English is uh, uh, a bit too basic. Non, ce que je vois, enfin, ce n'est pas franchement des questions, c'est plus des, des commentaires. Quoi. Par rapport à ce, ce trend euh, d'une vision euh, techniciste, je voudrais juste faire part de, de mon pessimisme absolu euh, <rire> à la suite du, du dernier Land Conference ah. de la Banque mondiale. Ah, vous vous assistez. Oui, oui donc, donc je suis allé à la dernière conférence et, et on en ressort quand même très, très, très pessimiste, quoi. Parce que, euh, surtout en ce moment, avec, avec les nouvelles technologies, la géomatique certes, mais euh, big data, euh, les euh, blockchain, alors la blockchain c'est le nouveau, le nouveau truc, euh, tout le monde s'emballe sur les blockchains, on a la solution au, au développement quoi. On a la solution au problème de reconnaissance des droits, euh, la technique est là, il faut juste la, la mettre en œuvre. Et, et ça fait peur quand on voit à quel point il n'y avait aucune dimension euh, critique, sur, attends, mais euh, on va reconnaître des droits, mais quels droits euh, sur, Comment on va les définir euh, Comment on va les identifier Non, ça, ça, non. il suffit d'avoir les, les outils, euh, et puis euh, on, on sera bon, quoi. Et ça, franchement, franchement ça fait peur. Euh, donc ça, c'est un, un premier point. Et sur aussi sur le, euh, le fait de, de traduire en termes techniques des, 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 des enjeux qui sont des enjeux d'abord euh, sociopolitique et socio-économique. La, la loi de 98 en Côte d'Ivoire sur la, 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 formalisation, euh, la formalisation des droits euh, dits coutumiers, c'est une illustration, une illustration parfaite. Quoi. Et, et avec également, une, il y, y a un lien avec une autre idée là que tu évoquais, sur pas de mémoire, enfin, un manque de mémoire des interventions passées. Je pense que ça, c'est quelque chose qui a été constaté dans <rire> grand, grand classique. Euh, mais, mais après... Il y, a, il y a, je pense, parfois un manque de mémoire, et puis il y a parfois aussi un refus de voir. Euh, et parce que c'est trop déstabilisant, évidemment, euh, si on commence à, à réaliser qu'il n'y a pas de magic bullet, et que, ma foi, il faudrait peut-être faire les choses un peu, un peu différemment. Et donc c'est un enjeu pour certaines corporations, évidemment. Euh, voilà. Ah, ah oui, après, je voulais, euh, juste sur l'histoire de la responsabilité sociale des entreprises. Alors moi, c'est marrant, par exemple, par rapport à l'histoire de Danone, Danone en Algérie, euh, parce que je travaille aussi un peu en Algérie, euh, un souci extrêmement aigu, de, mais je pense que c'est Danone en général. J'avais cette lecture-là, c'est pour ça que je suis un peu surpris de, de, de ce que tu disais, mais un, un souci très très marqué euh, de, de perte de réputation. Et il faut voir le profil actuel du patron de, de Danone, qui, est, qui était l'ancien directeur de la responsabilité sociale. Et, euh, et, et par exemple, en Algérie, Danone était sollicité pour s'impliquer dans des grands investissements sur des grosses concessions dans le sud euh, au, au Sahara. Et ils étaient a priori... Enfin, ils se posaient des questions, et ils nous posaient en tant que chercheurs des, des, des questions, pour dire, bon, mais euh, comment ça peut se passer Parce que leur souci, c'est qu'on ne vienne pas demain leur dire, vous contribuez à la dégradation environnementale, euh, etc. Et, et toujours pour continuer sur cette responsabilité sociale des entreprises, avec là une, une perspective aussi peut-être un peu plus positive, je sais qu'à titre d'expérience, par exemple en Côte d'Ivoire, on avait été mobilisé avec euh, quelques collègues euh, pour, à la demande d'une entreprise de plantation, euh, pour euh, évaluer, donc c'est une expertise confidentielle, on n'a jamais pu valoriser la chose malheureusement, mais pour, pour évaluer, euh, un, un nouveau schéma contractuel qu'ils voulaient mettre en place. Et eux, de la même façon, leur souci, c'était euh, d'éviter euh, que euh, des, des, des ONG euh, se lèvent euh, le lendemain pour dire « Regardez ce que vous avez fait, euh, land grabbing, etc. etc. » Donc il y avait ce souci-là, un effet de réputation très net, c'est une grosse, grosse entreprise, euh, effet de réputation. Et, 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 et en plus, comme on était quelque part mandaté euh, par l'AFD, il y avait aussi la caution AFD pour dire, regardez, si, nous, si on fait les choses, on les fait bien avec toutes les cautions qu'il faut. Nous, on avait été très critiques par rapport au schéma qu'ils avaient envisagé de mettre en place. Euh, le résultat des cours, c'est qu'ils n'ont pas mis en place ce schéma et qu'ils ont viré euh, les membres de la... De, de, de la de leur, euh, les manques d'entreprise, du, du service, euh, qui euh, avaient fait miroiter une solution euh, simple 
pour pouvoir euh, engager dans, ce, dans, ce, dans cette relation contractuelle les, les petits producteurs. Et, et, et pour terminer sur ce point, euh, l'anthropologue qui travaille avec nous s'est retrouvé finalement consultant maintenant pour euh, cette entreprise pour... <rire> je pense que le rôle des anthropologues, c'est marrant aussi, pour euh, et, et, et essayer de, euh, à l'avenir qu'il n'y ait, qu ait, qu ait pas trop de problèmes. Quoi. Voilà, donc je termine avec ça. Et juste mon dernier point, là encore, c'est... C'est plus un commentaire, ce n'est pas une question, mais moi je sais que pour ma part, je suis un peu comme certaines des personnes, des observés que, que, que tu avais. Et j'avais noté la question avant que tu arrives au point de dire, bah, après ils ont réagi en disant, oui tout ça c'est bien beau, mais qu'est-ce que tu proposes quoi. Et, et moi je sais que c'est quand même quelque chose qui pour moi me pose problème, à titre personnel. C'est-à-dire euh, proposer des lectures critiques euh, de pratiques, d'intervention, quelle qu'elle soit. Euh, enfin, je pense que c'est bien, c'est souhaitable, etc. Mais ensuite, dire euh, « Bon, ben, bah, maintenant, euh, je vais faire autre chose, j'arrête. » Ou « C'est plus mon boulot. » Alors, c'est vrai qu'il faut changer de casquette. Après, il faut changer de casquette. Mais il faut bien, à un moment donné, euh, quelque part, avoir un principe de réalisme, dire « Ok, enfin, peut-être la solution, c'est de rien faire et de laisser faire le marché. <rire> » J'en sais rien. Mais, mais si... Euh, si, euh, y compris dans une perspective positive, on pense qu'il y a potentiellement des choses à faire, bah, après, oui, il faut se mouiller. Quoi. Et moi, j'ai eu des discussions sur ce registre avec mon ami très cher, Jean-Pierre Chauveau, quoi, voilà, qui était sur ce registre-là. Moi, c'est un registre qui me, qui, me pose, qui me pose problème, à titre personnel. Merci. Point to make about that last uh, question, and, and for me, I think it comes down to where do we think that progressive change actually comes from? Um, and I, I think that's also an interesting analysis um, because it's not that good things don't happen in the world. You know, they do. Um, do they come from the development <coughs> paradigm? Not so often, right? Um, or not as often as, as we might hope or might think. So I think the question of what should we do might be too centered on the modes of action of development. And I think this is also a point that Jim Ferguson made in his book, The Anti-Politics Machine, right? He's saying basically that, you know, many people know, most people know the tactics appropriate to their own situation and you know whatever they can be doing they are doing probably um so one might think about well what you know what what are the fronts of political engagement are there things i might want to support are there things i might want to critique you know you you can choose your locations you know your courses etc but perhaps not limited by um, the concept of development you know, as a technical enterprise or the development project as the answer to all questions. So I don't think this kind of critique ends up with do nothing, but it may demote the concept of kind of, you know, um, technical development as a solution, mm. um, which of course is difficult for many people whose careers are entangled in that field. And frankly, I don't think it's unique to development. I mean, I think if I was to look at higher education, even in my own country, Canada, and say, are we, why do we do the things we do? You know, what, what is this thing called the university? Are we actually, what is education? Are we actually providing young people with the kind of uh, formation that's useful to them as young people in the world as it is. You'd have to say, and other ways that we value expertise, our modes of employment. I mean, if you were to take a good technical, you know, a good look at the enterprise of the university, you'd have to say it's a catastrophe, right? It's, it's full of incoherence, it's full of contradiction, it's full of tensions between the way it's organized and what it actually does, what it claims to do and what it does. So in order to have that kind of critique, I think I'd probably need to step out of the university <laughs> and make that a project, right? Um, so I don't think it's unique to development to say, you know, the enterprise is deeply flawed. Nevertheless, the enterprise of higher education is one in which I continue to participate. 
uh, even though I'm kind of aware of its flaws, although I haven't studied them fully, and yet I still take my salary there, I still live in this world, right? So, you know, I think, I think we're all, we all live uh, with many contradictions, and I think, you know, being aware of them is, is maybe something important, but it's not the end of the story, right? You know, there should be further steps. Um, so that, that's something, you know, one of the ways of thinking. And then I want to come back to a point that Pierre, you've asked me earlier, which I didn't respond to, is like, are we at the end of development? You know, is this whole thing kind of over? No, he says, well, you are the director of <laughs> EMD, so <laughs> obviously not. But I do think, um, you know, I wrote a piece last year, which was published in uh, Development Change called After Development. And you, <laughs> sorry? Right, yes, okay, so you, you, uh, you looked at that. So what I was arguing there is that, you know, development as we know it is based on a kind of a teleological view of, you know, a natural process, a trajectory, you know, from farm to factory, from country to city, um, from informal employment towards a proper job. You know, there's many, many elements which we see as being kind of linear and the idea of intentional development was to identify the blockages and the problems which prevented certain kinds of people and places from progressing along that evolutionary path. So even though we, we may superficially critique evolutionary thinking, in fact, the whole development paradigm is, ba is based on it, right? It's, it's integral to the enterprise. So in my view, that kind of trajectory, that kind of teleology, is absolutely untenable today. I, I don't see any reason why one would expect that in each and every country, because we are still organized nationally, one would see a path from country to city or farm to factory, right? I mean, globally, there may be an increase in manufacturing, but if it's concentrated in China, that's of no <coughs> use to you if you lose your land in Sulawesi, right? You, you, you have no access to those jobs. It's not that no manufacturing is taking place, but it's not taking place in one country, right? The global flows of capital, not matched by global flows of labor, you know, means that there are whole areas of the world which are not on such a trajectory and will not be. I see no reason why that would change. So I think that that, you know, more serious look at not just the intentional development, which in some ways is easy enough to critique, but at this kind of stubborn uh, residual teleology, which guides so much of our thinking, uh, I think we need to really to have a good critical look at that as well. And then to say, well, if development, as in the teleological unfolding, is not what's happening and not what's going to happen, how then would one think about the welfare of the world, right? What then would you need to do or to think about in countries and places which are not on any such pathway, you know, and, and will not be? How will conditions of life be secured for people whose labor is surplus to the requirements of capital or located in the wrong place, blocked from migration, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I think that's like a different, for me, that's kind of the kind of thinking we need to do after development. It's not how to fix development projects. It's how to think about the fundamental question of inequality, poverty, welfare, which are still the big questions in a way which doesn't depend upon any kind of teleological assumption or a technical intervention, right? How else would one then conceptualize the world kind of like after development? So that's, that's kind of my current thinking on that. And it's, of course, it's, it's pretty challenging, right? Because we are, we are used to working within a teleological assumption. And so I, that I've wrote that piece and I wrote another piece recently uh, with Jim Ferguson on this question and we, we focused in on the labor question. Um, it's called Beyond the Proper Job. Uh, political economic analysis after the century of laboring man, I think we called it. It's a working paper, it's out on the web, it's free, it's easy to get. Um, so there, you know, we just took on the labor part of this and said, well, you know, if, if, if the proper job, you know, we think so much of our, our analysis is based on, if even though you look at ILO, it's like standard employment and then everything else is non-standard. 
In fact, only about 20% of the world's population are in standard employment and the other 80% are in non-standard employment, but our category is negatively defined in relation to this teleology which assumes that sooner or later standard employment or the proper job is, is what's going to happen or should happen. So of course it's something that people very deeply desire to happen, but it's actually not happening, nor is it going to happen, right? So if that's the case, how then would one think about the world of work, about livelihood, about land, about social membership? You know, the job is often people's claim to national belonging and being a contributor to society, etc. I mean, many things have, have been made to hang on the job, both for the individual life course, you know, the graduate who then gets the job. Uh, you know, the, we're, we're increasingly, high school education is becoming far more broadly distributed. And all these high school graduates aspire to a proper job, you know, in a context where no such job is coming, right? But they don't do nothing. What do they do? Like, how do they live? How do they organize? What do they think? So that was just you know, one attempt to say, if you just take one arena uh, and, and eliminate the teleology, what then would be the questions you would ask? So I think, you know, that, that's what I think of as kind of frontiers for us and thinking, of, and to me, this is all about development, but it's sort of like <coughs> development after development. It's about, you know, how these questions of distribution, of how people can live a decent life, um, unhinged from the development problematic as a, as a teleological one. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but that's where I'm headed with this at the moment. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's very interesting because I was thinking, um, you know, the, the development of the anthropology of development in yes. the 80s, 90s was based on the same idea, but at the micro level or the development project level, in a way. It was, okay, let's, let's see what happens within a development intervention and mm. forget about uh, all the all what is around so the ideology of development and so on let's see what happens in terms of interaction between actors mm. workers developers very and micro. so on yeah. yeah and what you propose is uh, the same idea so going outside this theology of, uh, of of theology or theology of development um, but at at more ma macro level in a way mm. so that I think maybe there are some articulation or mm -hmm. complementary. You're thinking about the, um, that trend in development anthropology, which was about actors. Yeah, actors like Norman Long or Olivier yeah. Tardin, this yeah. kind of orientation. Right. Yeah. Do you have any concepts to add? <laughs> <laughs> this is the part that gets more interesting for me because I get to hear what you are thinking. Or is I already know what I think, right? So I'm interested to know what you're thinking. Euh, merci beaucoup Tania. Euh, je, je me retrouve <coughs> beaucoup dans, dans ton propos, dans ton discours, euh, parce que c'est mon vécu euh, presque quotidien. <coughs> euh, je suis un petit peu euh, dans cette tension permanente entre euh, la volonté de, de bien faire euh, ou de mieux faire, et euh, en même temps, cette, euh, ce désespoir un peu permanent qu'évoquait euh, Jean-Philippe euh, devant euh, la lourdeur des, des institutions et l'absence de changements politiques réels et l'aggravation euh, des tensions euh, sur le terrain, dans les pays dans lesquels on, on intervient. Euh, comme notre ami, là, je travaille beaucoup en Afrique sahélienne, je remarque une, une chose quand même, c'est que il y a un certain nombre de, de contextes où euh, les populations, ou en tout cas certaines communautés, certaines cultures, euh, refusent le développement. Euh, C'est-à-dire euh, ont leur propre dynamique. Un pays dont on parle assez peu, qui est la, la Mauritanie, qui est un pays euh, organisé euh, sur une base tribale, euh, pluriethnique, parce qu'il y a quatre ethnies, certes, mais qui sont très circonscrites à des régions... Euh, précise. Euh, je remarquais récemment qu'effectivement, c'était le pays qui était peut-être le moins frappé parce que le collègue disait euh, les attaques euh, dites terroristes, djihadistes, tout ce qu'on voudra. Euh, ça ne veut pas dire qu'ils ne sont pas impliqués euh, dans des réseaux d'influence, qu'ils ne font pas non plus du trafic d'armes euh, de, ou de, de matières à haute valeur ajoutée. Euh, mais bon, c'est un, 
pays qui me semble assez, alors je dis pas que c'est un modèle, hein, loin de là, euh, mais qui me semble assez résisté finalement à, et qui désespère beaucoup toutes les bureaucraties du développement. Je me souviens qu'il y a une vingtaine d'années, <coughs> l'anthropologue Pierre Bonte, que certains ont peut-être connu ici, avait rédigé pour la Banque mondiale un, un document qui s'appelle « Culture et patrimoine ». Donc c'est un terme qui est assez peu, je dirais, utilisé dans le monde du développement, hein, culture et patrimoine aussi, euh, où justement, il, parce que c'était un fin connaisseur de cette société euh, mauritanienne, il montrait justement quels étaient un peu les, les traits euh, permanents. Non pas que cette société ne connaisse pas des, cha des changements, bien sûr, ou des, des, des évolutions, mais euh, il y avait quand même un certain nombre de, de points euh, qui organise de manière euh, durable euh, la société tribale euh, mort, euh, les morts étant l'une des ethnies de la Mauritanie. Euh, et, et, et quand je regarde un petit peu ce qui sort aujourd'hui comme euh, terme de référence pour des, des missions ou pour des projets, récemment j'en ai reçu un sur les questions de changement climatique euh, euh, pour aider le ministère de l'Environnement mauritanien euh, par rapport à tout ce qui est... Euh, euh, limitation des effets du changement climatique dans un pays qui est sahélo-saharien, euh, donc très durement touché par certains phénomènes comme les sécheresses, etc., mais qui ne sont pas forcément directement reliés au changement climatique. Il enfin, n'y a pas de mécanisme. Euh, je trouvais ça euh, hyper ambitieux <coughs> dans la formulation, avec une volonté là aussi de, de, de bien faire et de et d'armer, je dirais, un peu l'administration de, de, de la Mauritanie face à des changements auxquels ils vont être confrontés. Mais en même temps, c'était complètement sous-dimensionné en, en termes de moyens, c'est-à-dire que euh, tout repose dans les termes de référence, dans le design du projet, euh, sur un assistant technique qui, qui doit euh, changer toute la culture du ministère de l'Environnement <rire> <rire> mauritanien, qui est un petit ministère, mais, euh, mais, mais qui en même temps, euh, à l'instar des autres ministères, fait l'objet d'un trafic de, de, de postes de, poste, euh, de fonctionnaires hein, ou de postes de, de, de ministres, de secrétaires d'État, etc., euh, co comme les autres. Quoi. Et donc il y a toujours un jeu politique euh, au même titre des, que les autres ministères. Quoi. Et, et donc il y a ce projet donc, financé par l'Union européenne. Euh, avec un, un gros budget, hein, un gros budget mais, euh, mais, mais très peu de, de personnel, ce qui fait qu'il y a un décalage complet entre le, le potentiel humain euh, mobilisable et euh, les moyens mis à disposition, et ne parlons pas des ambitions, euh, des objectifs à atteindre et des résultats à atteindre. Donc évidemment, j'ai refusé le poste. <rire> mais, mais la mission est impossible. <rire> mais surtout, je me suis empressé d'envoyer le rapport de Pierre Bonte, l'anthropologue qui a longtemps travaillé sur les sociétés mauritaniennes. Et tout le monde trouve le rapport très intéressant parce qu'il rentre par la, la culture, par l'histoire, euh, par euh, une profonde connaissance des, des mécanismes de fonctionnement de... Euh, comment dire, de, de la société mauritanienne. Ça fait trois ou quatre fois que je fais le coup sur la Mauritanie, je balance le rapport de, de Pierre et à chaque fois il y a, il y a un, une bonne, une, un, un bon accueil, une bonne réception. Euh, et donc finalement c'est une petite anecdote, mais euh, c'est ce que j'essaye de faire un petit peu tout le temps. C'est pour ça que je viens dans vos, dans vos réunions euh, ici, c'est de temps en temps toujours balancer un peu des des informations pour jouer un petit peu au franc-tireur, parce que c'est finalement c est, c est un, un monde, ce monde du développement, c'est un monde qui se prête un petit peu à ça. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a des choses tellement grosses, tellement contradictoires qu'on qu nous, qu nous propose, que finalement c'est presque facile de, de créer un petit peu, de faire une contre-tension en quelque sorte, pour amener les gens un peu à réfléchir, à réagir, etc., mais sans illusion. C'est-à-dire que les, la pression et les, et les forces sont extrêmement lourdes, et je pourrais évoquer, mais peut-être, comme tu l'as fait sur ton, ta présentation, ton livre que je n'ai pas lu, mais ça fait longtemps que j'en entends parler de ce livre, euh, euh, je pourrais raconter plein d'histoires comme ça, en fait, hein euh, la semaine dernière, j'étais euh, reçu, euh, re, pas reçu, j'étais audité par deux inspecteurs antifraude de l'Union européenne, de la Commission européenne. C'est l'Office de lutte antifraude. 
su, suite à une évaluation qu'on a faite avec un collègue burkinabé euh, sur des détournements de fonds en matière d'assainissement rural. Euh, plusieurs millions d'euros détournés, etc., parce que attribution de marché public à des entreprises qui n'ont pas fait le travail. Bon. Et ce qui a étonné les inspecteurs anti-fraude, c'est que euh, l'Union européenne, la délégation de l'Union européenne dans le pays, a multiplié par 8 le budget pour la même opération, et ils vont, euh, comment dire, euh, il va se passer la même chose, c'est-à-dire qu'il va y avoir tous les mêmes mécanismes d'attribution de marché. Euh, à des entreprises qui n'en sont pas, en fait, puisqu'elles n'ont pas d'obligation de résultat, puisqu'elles ne sont jamais sanctionnées non plus. Euh, donc il y a une reproduction permanente et même une amplification, euh, une, une augmentation très forte de, 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 à la fois des budgets et de tous ces projets, etc., pour atteindre des soi-disant objectifs du millénaire ou bien des objectifs du développement durable mis en place par les Nations Unies, etc., euh, où on s'aperçoit très souvent que ce n'est pas toujours très, très réaliste, mais surtout que c'est beaucoup de triches. Euh, euh, beaucoup de triches. Triche, on triche sur les chiffres, on triche sur les, sur les données, évidemment. Enfin, c'est absolument épouvantable. Quoi. Et donc, il euh, y, a, y a tout un... Je retiens l'expression, il euh, y a le, le masque et la réalité. Mask and real. Hein Real and mask, euh, ça c'est tout à fait ça quoi, parce que euh, on est constamment dans le, euh, c'était l'expression que j'ai entendu il n'y a même pas 15 jours euh, au, au Sénégal euh, où euh, on, on disait mais tout le monde fait semblant quoi en fait, c'est tous les, les donateurs, les agences de coopération, les consultants, les experts, etc. font semblant, euh, sauf ceux qui se font engueuler, comme moi ça m'arrive de temps en temps, ou, ou pas payer même. <rire> Mais euh, et, et donc finalement c'est vraiment un, un théâtre. Hein. Le développement c'est anti-politics machine, d'accord Mais c'est aussi un théâtre. Hein. C'est vraiment euh, une, une scène, plus qu'une arène d'ailleurs, c'est aussi une scène. Hein. Oui, oui. Et donc des, des histoires Is comme... Is this a good theater Oui, oui. Donc c'est pour ça que je suis venu euh, t'écouter, parce que déjà je t'avais entendu euh, il y a quelques années, je crois que tu étais venu pour euh, l'APAD aussi. Oui. Euh, et bon, ça m'avait bien plu. Et, euh, et donc je reviens aujourd'hui. C'est vrai que je, je me retrouve beaucoup dans, mm. dans ce que tu expliques, avec peut-être une, une, une différence, c'est que... En fait, on est constamment dedans, on est constamment en, mm. en tension, et mm. il ne faut pas devenir fou. Mm. Hein, mon problème, c'est ça. Moi, je suis à yeah. 3 ans ou 5 ans de la retraite. <rire> je ne veux pas devenir fou dans ce monde du développement. <rire> Donc, je viens me ressourcer auprès des collègues qui, yeah. pour certains, sont devenus des amis. Mm. Euh, et pour, pour essayer de retrouver un petit peu de logique, puis essayer de... C'est ce que je disais à mon correspondant de la coopération belge au Sénégal. Là, je lui ai dit, mais... Euh, le principe numéro un de la coopération ou de, comment dire, de la consultance pour le développement, c'est ne pas nuire. Do not harm. Harmful, harmless. Mm. Euh, et, et, donc, euh, et donc, il faut regarder les contradictions euh, des projets que vous faites vous, au niveau des agences mm. de, de développement. Donc, euh, mon collègue belge, je, je lui faisais remarquer qu'au Sénégal, ce qu'ils ont fait, c'était un peu une catastrophe, parce qu'ils ont fait des, des ouvrages hydrauliques, des petits mm. barrages sur des des, des bas-fonds, des petits marigots, mais qui ont un, une hydraulicité très faible, donc qui, qui n'ont pas beaucoup de ressources en eau, faible débit, euh, pas, peu de crues, c'est dans le bassin arachidier, c'est une zone sableuse. Et la première chose que disent les, les villageois, c'est disent mais vous avez fait des barrages pour qu'on ait de l'eau, mais on, on a peut-être un petit peu d'eau, parce que c'est même pas vrai, il n'y a même pas d'eau. L'eau, elle, elle s'enfonce, elle percole hein, tout de suite, elle s'infiltre, mais on n'a plus de poissons. Et euh, on n'a plus de poissons à la période la plus dure de l'année, c'est-à-dire euh, en pleine euh, saison d'hivernage quand il y a de l'eau, parce que le poisson remonte les, les, les marigots, les bas-fonds. Euh, mais c'est surtout la période de soudure, c'est-à-dire c'est la période où on a une, un manque de nourriture, où, où les prix sont élevés avant les récoltes. Euh, donc, euh, donc, donc, the will to improve, euh, ben bah non. Ah, <rire> c'est une catastrophe. Mais, mais euh, c est, c est, voilà. Et donc là, on, ça, on discute de ça. Et, mm. et, et c'est une discussion sous tension, c'est-à-dire qu'il euh, faut les mettre euh, au pied du mur pour qu'ils acceptent, les agences de coopération et donc les, les ingénieurs, etc., qui, qui travaillent pour eux, euh, les mettre au pied du mur pour essayer de provoquer un choc, 
pour euh, euh, comment dire, les, les, les faire évoluer dans leur, euh, dans leur réflexion. Quoi. Mais, mais c'est un travail qui, qui est extrêmement euh, difficile, prenant, intense, qui par moments crée des tensions, y compris dans, dans la vie personnelle. <rire> Et donc c'est... C'est pas évident euh, aujourd'hui, je dirais, par exemple, d'enseigner à des élèves agronomes, là, ici, juste à côté, à l'Institut des régions chaudes, ou bien euh, dans d'autres euh, universités avec des, des, je, des jeunes géographes. Alors c'est peut-être plus facile avec les géographes parce qu'ils ils peuvent devenir professeurs de géographie, donc là c'est facile. Ouais. Maintenant, un agronome, il euh, n'y a pas beaucoup de postes de professeurs d'agronomie, peut-être moins qu'en géographie ou dans l'enseignement secondaire. Ouais. Donc... Euh, euh, et donc on, on crée aussi bon, vraiment peut-être des fois des, un petit peu des impasses professionnelles mm -hmm. euh, parce que ce, ce monde du développement a, a pris énormément d'ampleur euh, à travers tous ces mécanismes financiers. Euh, Il y, y a des budgets absolument colossaux euh, yeah. qui sont sous-utilisés. Et d'ailleurs, une des raisons de, de l'enquête antifraude que j'ai mentionnée là pour le Burkina, c'est parce que les modalités de financement ont changé. C'est-à-dire qu'on est passé de l'aide par projet à l'aide budgétaire. L'aide budgétaire qui ensuite est gérée directement par une administration. Et il euh, y a des mécanismes qui permettent d'allouer des marchés à des entreprises pour faire des, des, des latrines et des structures d'assainissement. Bon, ça c'est vrai dans d'autres domaines, hein, dans l'eau potable, c'est vrai etc. dans d'autres secteurs. Euh, et il y a une créativité dans les pays du Sud pour détourner l'argent qui est absolument... Yeah. Euh, c'est extraordinaire. Donc c'est une façon aussi yeah. de refuser le développement, en quelque sorte. Il hein. euh, y a une trentaine d'années, il y avait une fille qui avait écrit, Axel Cabou, je ne sais pas si vous vous souvenez, qui avait écrit euh, « Et si l'Afrique refusait le développement yeah. ?» euh, donc en fait, euh, voilà, on est constamment dans ce genre de, de yeah. configuration. Donc c'est pour ça que je yeah. pense que c'est important le, le, le travail ou le, que tu fais. C'est très important si ça peut être, je dirais, un petit peu diffusé pour amener yeah. les gens à ne serait-ce que réfléchir. Quoi, parce que changer les pratiques, après, c'est autre chose. Et changer les politiques, c'est encore plus dur. <rire> en tout cas, merci beaucoup. Um, p students in development studies courses, anthropology courses, geography, political <coughs> science, and hopefully not just in the English-speaking countries now, also in French-speaking countries and, and so on. And so those are the people who, uh, as a result, one hopes of their critical education, go out into the world and work in many spheres. But I think you're right that these institutions are extremely... Um, rigid and difficult to change. So obviously one has to start quite far back in the chain of, <laughs> in the chain of production. But I, I think I mean, your, your question, your issue of, of sort of cynicism, mm. it's a big one, right? And I think there's a, been a few volumes actually since I finished this book on the life of development workers, the personal life. And one of the main things which comes through in those studies is this difficulty of how do you go to sleep at night? You know, either cynicism or despair, uh, frustration, mm -hmm. fear, you know, basically a lot of things that personal things that people face when the world does not conform and they realize that they are entrenched in a contradiction. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's a serious thing to intervene mm -hmm. and to ma have massive budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a big deal, <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, veux, uh, no? Okay. <laughs> et, et, et là, il y a un enjeu politique majeur. Absolument. Yeah. Uh, parce que. Tu as une. Enjeu politique euh, majeur. Euh, yeah. Parce que si les contribuables européens, pour reprendre le, le, le cas des, des programmes européens, si les contribuables européens savaient comment sont gérés ces programmes, il enfin, y aurait encore plus de réactions anti-projets euh, européens qu'actuellement. Moi, j'ai travaillé pendant des... Enfin, je continue en, en Algérie. J'ai croisé, croisé une quantité de gestionnaires de projets européens. Mais on parle de entre 2 et 23 millions d'euros. Ce pas des petites choses quand même. 23 millions d'euros, c'est pas mal dans le domaine culturel, en plus. Et avec un... Enfin, un... Alors, c'est-à-dire ce n'est pas seulement dans le... Dans le... 
dans le, les programmes de développement. C'est dans, dans tous les programmes. Euh... Ces programmes, euh, y, y compris des, des programmes qui se veulent opérationnels, où on va équiper un pays en dispositifs de sécurité maritime euh, qui seront financés. Et puis trois ans après, on fera un autre programme. Le dispositif qui n'a jamais utilisé, qui est poussiéreux, on le met de côté. On en remet un autre à la place. Et, 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 puis, et puis voilà. Mais il y a une multiple... Enfin, on, on pourrait donner de, de multiples exemples de, de gabegie et d'inefficacité de ça, mais, mais qui se chiffre en, en millions, millions d'euros. Donc si ça, s'il y avait un vrai travail journalistique euh, d'investigation c'est une catastrophe, quoi. Yeah. C'est vraiment une catastrophe. Right. Mais bon, c'est comme ça. Non, mais comme disait euh, Gramsci, il faut être pessimiste par la raison, mais optimiste par la volonté, non uh... Eh oui, il faut garder ça un peu. But well, that's the thing, like, uh, this is also what, you know, what I try, I think that a critic is not the same as a cynic. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I try to keep these two things, you know, in balance. Like, I'm, I, because I actually, many people I know who work in development are wonderful people, right? Full of the will to improve, including members of my own family. And I know they're intelligent and they are doing the best that they can, but they work under a structure Uh, which is, um, in my view, doesn't hold, right, and, and should not be continued. But uh, that's, that's like the university. I work in a structure which I think does not hold and actually should not be continued. And yet I still work in it as well. So there's a bit of a humility necessary as well, right? We all inhabit contradictions. The question is, what, kind, what can we do to bring these contradictions into the realm of debate. And that, for me, is the, that's the point about critique and also politics, right? It's, it's to take the banal world we inhabit with all of its ways of doing and thinking and its standardized practices and so on and make it the object of a kind of critical reflection. I, I do think that's a, a worthwhile enterprise, but I'm not uh, expecting the revolution either. So <laughs> okay. Thank you. Merci. <rire> Merci à tous. C'était très intéressant pour moi d'avoir cet échange. Merci.